All right, so this is the second class. Um, and this is the handouts that I, I suggest that you should read. Um, and there was a question on, I think campus were about what exactly you should read. Well, I don't expect you to remember everything. Like for instance, for homework one, you would require to identify which types of contaminant it is or which class it is. So this is uh, the list of contaminants here. So you just have to look for them inside it. Uh, but most importantly, you should know the difference between different class of contaminants. For instance, you have D, you have a different list of contaminants, D, F list, um, K list, uh, U list. You should know at least the difference, what those differences are. Uh, not necessarily very specific, each individual contaminants, but at least the, the concept behind the differences. Um, so that's all um, for the handouts and the homework. And let's get to the today's class. Uh, so today we are going to learn about how do you identify different hazardous waste type? And most importantly, how do you know whether they are toxic or not just based on the chemical formula or just based on the molecular structures, okay? So the first thing is now some announcement. Um, the homework is due next week on Thursday. So these are the deadlines to sit here upcoming deadlines. Uh, quiz is on Thursday. That means I'll release the quiz. It's not in the class. You have uh, 10 minutes or based on how many questions are there. Maximum 10 questions. Uh, so if it is a uh, 10 question, then you'll have 20 minutes. So two minutes for questions. And again, the quiz questions, similar questions are given every, every slides. So you have some idea about those questions. Uh, those are not calculations. So that means you will be able to um, I mostly answer within a minute or a few seconds if you understand the question. And project topic is due on 21st January. So that by that time, uh, you will be, you should have a group formed. But again, as I said, I give you opportunity to form your own group. Uh, but if you can't, don't worry about it because I'll put you in a group. Um, so this is your chance to, if you know somebody you want to be group with them, uh, you can, uh, talk with each other and say that uh, we want to form a group, okay? Uh, but if you don't know anybody, just don't worry. I'll just post, a, uh, I'll just put you guys uh, in different group based on your interest that you uh, fill up in your, um, in your, uh, um, that questionnaire. Uh, but I'll also list some of the group um, project, um, project titles or mostly project concepts so that you know if your interest is in one of those projects, then you could be a, as a group there. So I think my best um, best advice is you should form a group if you know somebody or if you have a similar interest in terms of topic. That makes it a lot easier to work with. All right, so we'll form a group by next class. Uh, next class is Tuesday. So by that time, what you can do is you can go to Campusware and say that I, I'm looking for a group and I'm having this interest on this particular topic if you have any. Otherwise, just say that, you know, then, then uh, you can start forming groups. And then whoever is not part of any group, I'll put them based on your interest. Again, I saw that total 46 students are on campus where um, that means, you know, we have still uh, more than 15 students who are not registered to campus where I communicate lots of information on campus where. So if you're not on campus where you are missing out those um, and again, if you're sending me email, I may may not respond because I do, um, I lag behind on emails. There are so many emails that I have to go through. Um, but if it is on campus where I see it because I check every, uh, at least I'll check once a day or twice a day. So if you question are there, I'll respond within that 24 hours. Um, okay, so that's all about announcement. And today we are gonna learn about the objective is two. You know? So as I said, I asked you that you should look for the uh, label on a on anything that you use. For instance, if you use a uh, use a facial uh, screens, or if you use some products and in your kitchen, uh, just look for what they are made up of. You know? So that those chemical structures tell lots about them. So we'll learn more about it if you just post them or if you have interest on in that. But today we are going to learn why certain name structure or known contaminants behave certain way. Um, so first thing we are going to learn is how 
how does EPA test hazardous materials? How do they know whether this is hazardous or not? Because by assumption, everything was used was non-hazardous. Once we start learning more about them, we say, okay, this is hazardous. For instance, asbestos. Asbestos was a miracle a substance in before 1970s. Everybody was using asbestos for everything. So now it become hazardous because people found that it can cause lung cancer. Uh, so everybody has to know what's the reason behind it. Uh, so that's why we are going to understand all those today. The first thing is to identify. Uh, US EPA has uh, made a list of hazardous chemicals. That's the handout that I just showed you. And they have found that it has known toxicity or it has known um, reaction. So as I said, there are four different class or four different characteristics. We learned that last class. It can cast fire, it can be corrosive, it can be very reactive, or it can be very toxic. toxic. So if one of those four, it is hazardous. And if it is not listed within those, and you know that there is a known consequence of that particular chemicals uh, to humans or animals, even at low dose, then it is hazardous. Because EPA doesn't have the capacity to go through all the chemicals. If a chemical is causing harm, that is hazardous, okay? And um, then the last one is, does it contain any toxic constituents listed in that list? Uh, the list I sent you, or I show you. Um, if it is, if, even though that's not the main constituent, even if it is a little bit there, then you, it, it can be treated as hazardous. So that means effectively, if, if your answer is yes to any of these three questions, it is going to be hazardous, okay? Ultimately, what determines is toxicity, whether it causes any toxicity, any harm to anybody, okay? Uh, so based on where it is produced, how it is handled, uh, mostly where it is being processed, you can call different lists. It makes it a lot easier to uh, to group them. So that's how these lists are there, F, K, P, uh, U list. Um, there are also universal lists. Universal list means something that is produced in household product, for instance, battery. Um, batteries are uh, handled in certain specific way. So that's called universal risk, uh, universal uh, chemicals, okay? Because that's handled specific way. So again, your goal is to look for the differences. What's the difference between F and K, or K and P? Uh, so those are the things I want you to understand, okay? So when I have a questions on quiz, those are based on only that, not basically looking for very specific uh, pollutants. Uh, so again, EPA follow this particular process, as you see over here. First thing is, is this a solid waste? Solid waste means the definition of solid waste that EPA does. If it's no, then you don't have to worry about, uh, at least you know, it's not subjected to these particular regulations. Almost everything is solid waste, most of them. Uh, for instance, think of uh, wood chips. It's not a solid waste, so you don't have to handle it. But if wood chips contain a lot of chemicals that somebody spray it, then it becomes solid waste. Um, so if it is yes, then you go to that all these questions. Is this waste excluded from the definition of solid waste or hazardous waste? If it is no, then you go back what kind of list it is, what kind of characteristic it is. And then um, if this, uh, then you see if it is listed and those are the list I provided. If it is one of them, then you have to handle it as a hazardous waste. Again, just to give you a reminder that these are the four different characteristics we discussed and you should think of them every time you see a list. And here are the common four examples of uh, hazardous waste that we normally deal with, or you, you might heard about this one. The very first one is volatile organic contaminants. Uh, the second one is semi-volatile organic contaminants, okay? So V stands for volatile, okay? And this S stands for semi. And OC means organic contaminants. Uh, so these are the list just to give you ideas, you know, and these are the the reason the volatile organic contaminants are present in most cases, because we use a lot of solvent. Think of if you if you paint anything, it's a solvent because you don't want it to be wet. Uh, it doesn't want you to be um, things to evaporate so that it dry out quickly. So that's why lots of solvents are used. 
even for dry cleaning, it's used a lot of solvent. Um, then um, you have also pesticides it's used for uh, in agriculture, it's used in garden. So these are the common pollutants you might find. And then metals, metals, almost everything you use have metals. Um, so we, we, these are the common list of uh, pollutants that you may consider. Um, and then there are new type of pollutants that is not before present. For instance, PFAS, you might heard about this one more, uh, which is a fluorinated organic contaminants, uh, which is uh, coming from um, uh, all your, you know, all your, most of the hydrophilic or not hydrophilic, anything that you don't want to, to be dirty very quickly. For instance, your, um, your winter coat has a coatings that makes it not stick with water. So that means it doesn't get wet. So that has PFAS. Any kind of Teflon um, or any kind of non-stick cookware has PFAS. Uh, so this is, uh, people start finding that these, these are not actually good, this cause cancer. Uh, so now this has been not used or replaced by some other types of um, materials. So that's why you don't see much non-stick cookware. It's more, um, uh, now ceramic and other kind of cookware is being more popular. So again, um, there could be so many different types of chemicals that could be hazardous. But your goal is to find out why certain things are more toxic than other. So those are what we are going to learn. So now, when you think of toxicity, you have to think of not just the pollutant, because everything can be toxic. For instance, I give you an example here. Do you think pure water is toxic? Um, pure water, when I say it's a DI or milky water, in the sense it's purified water, there is nothing, no mineral inside it. Um, how many of you think it's, um, is it toxic? If I give you, let's say, if somebody drinks 10 gallons or, or one, let's say average human being, um, you know, the average amount of daily intake of water is a, let's say five glass of water. That's something we normally, we need to drink every day. Um, but if you, if I give you this purified five glass of water, do you think it's uh, healthy? And if it's yes or no, and then if it's no, then what's the reason? Any volunteer? I feel bad because I just remember this from 153, but if nobody else like wants to say it, then I can say what I remember from 153. That's okay. I think it's good to discuss again. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think what somebody said in 153 was that um, effectively, if it's completely pure water, um, it ends up like pooling salts and minerals that you need um, out of your bloodstream. And uh, yeah, it's not good for you. Exactly. So the pure water is very corrosive because of that. Because that's the reason when you drink water, it has lots of minerals. It creates that os balance or osmosis balance. If that's the same reason if you go to, let's say you uh, you go for surfing and you stay in the ocean for many, let's say three, four hours, you come out, your skin is pretty dry. And do you know why they are dry? You are inside water, it should not be dry. Is it because the salt in the seawater pulls away water from your your cells, your skin. Exactly. So as you see, water has affinity for salt and salt has affinity for water. So if water doesn't have any salt, it pulls salt out of your body or anywhere. That's how we get minerals in, in lake water or stream water because it goes through rock. Pure, so, pure rainwater doesn't have anything. Okay. When you evaporate water, it's just pure water. And then when it drops on the soil or on rocks, it dissolves that minerals. That's how we get to drink those water or um, spring water are a lot of rich enriched with minerals, natural minerals, that's something we need. But if you purify, let's say reverse osmosis or other way, you remove those minerals. So that's why when you do reverse osmosis, it always adds some amount of minerals before they distribute. Uh, so that's one thing, but just doesn't mean that if you drink one glass of very pure water, it's going to cause harm. It all depends on how much you are drinking. So the point I want to make here is everything can be toxic. Okay? Everything you're exposed to can be toxic. It depends on how much. Okay? Water is not toxic, but if you drink a lot, lot water, obviously it becomes toxic. Okay? So the, the idea that 
toxicity is related to just the chemical is not the right way to think. You have to also think of amount. Okay, how much amount I have to expose to before it becomes toxic. So that's why when you think of um, substance is toxic or not, you should be asking two questions. How much exposure I have? If you are not exposed to a lot of pollutants or a lot high concentrations, maybe it's not, you should not be worried about it. For instance, every day you drive a car and you put, you may refill your tank, let's say once in two weeks based on how much you drive. That means you are exposed to a lot of this gasoline or fume uh, during, that, uh, uh, during that time. But if you do that every day, daily basis, then you might reach a point where it is more toxic for you. Uh, so exposure is very uh, important part of toxicity. It means how much you are going to consume. Now, what we are going to discuss today is more of reactivity. Okay, so toxicity is exposure times reactivity. Um, so even a pollutant is very reactive. For instance, let's say battery is has lots of toxic uh, toxic chemical inside it, but you are not exposed to it because you are not handling battery. You are not opening it. So that means it's not toxic to you. Uh, you can safely use battery. So that's why toxicity is a combination of exposure and reactivity. And we'll learn about reactivity now. And exposure is basically mass. How much you are exposed is depends on time you're exposed to. For instance, if you're, uh, if you're exposed to something for years, you know, it accumulates in your body. Um, and then it also depends on the, the mass time time. And the mass is volume time concentration. So that means if you're drinking water and drink, Water is polluted, you have to think of how much water you are drinking. And then what concentration of pollutant in that. Um, so this is the contaminant. And this is the medium. Um, and then medium volume times constant contaminant concentration is give you mass. And you are then you are looking for a mass of that pollutant for kilograms or weight of your body. Uh, to determine its toxicity. So that's the whole idea of a uh, concept of toxicity. And then uh, you divide this pollutant into two groups. One is acute toxicity, another is chronic toxicity. Acute toxicity means the moment you expose to it, it will cause harm. Uh, chronic means it, even if you are exposed, it's not going to cause any harm, uh, but in long term, it may have an impact. For instance, lead. Okay, uh, if you if you if you are exposed to lead, um, now, it doesn't cause any harm immediately, but if you are if you are exposed to lead for a long time, then it start you will start showing effect. For instance, potassium cyanide. You know, so if something that you might have heard about in many Bond movie, you know, a lot of times when the um, spy is captured and they they take a tablet or they have something, they eat it and they die immediately. So that's called acute toxicity. So cyanide is something that that um, that affects the balance of ions flow in our cell. So the moment you uh, eat a little bit of those that uh, disrupt that cell balance, that means it can't, the cellular function is not going to continue uh, exposed to high concentration of cyanide. And so that's why, you know, if you see a cyanide tablet is this reason why it is toxic, you know? So that's the, another example of toxicity. Um, so, but a lot of times EPA, what they do is, they look for this concentration. It's called lethal dose. Lethal dose means, you know, at what concentration uh, some, um, you can see that particular test body will die. Uh, mostly, you know, they look for um, the way the test is, they test on rabbit, um, uh, rat, or mouse. That is not the very right way. Mouse, and sometimes they also use cell toxicity, cellular toxicity. Uh, so they look for these, uh, these, these ways to find out how much it has a lethal dose. The reason this 50 come in here is that means, you know, uh, the, the, const, uh, the, uh, the dose, uh, dose means mass, uh, at which the 50% the, the of the test species will die. So this is 50% species would die, okay. So usually what the way the test is, they have a different amount. If I draw a line here and I looked at the percentage and death, okay? Um, so that means, you know, how much percentage of the, let's say you start with 100 a mouse and you, you give them the different amount of concentrations. 
and then you see what at what concentration 50% of the test species will die. So you increase the concentration, then the, as you increase more and more, the more death will occur. And then at some point, it will be more death. After a point, everybody will die. So that means, you know, this is like, this is the way they test it. So typically, this is the dose response curve. So this is response. And this is dose. Dose is, means um, uh, milligram of pollutants or the, the species that you are adding uh, per unit mass of the, the kilogram of body weight. Okay. So as you increase the dose amount, the more dies. So this is, let's say, 100%. So that means this is 100%. An LD50 is basically you're looking for 50%, and then you look for that concentration of the dose amount. So this one will be LD50. So what, what is more toxic? If the LD50 is very low, uh, that means it's more toxic. That means at the very low concentration, it can cause 50% to die. So if the LD50 decreases, that means your toxicity increases okay that means you need very small amount of dose to uh, cause death so this is us example of showing that different way of looking for uh, ld15s but sometimes you might see that you know if you see this graph here you see, observe effects at the at the very small concentration that means only at zero um, zero concentration you have no effect even you have very small, tiny amount, it starts showing the effect. And this is typically true for carcinogenic chemical because you want to be extra conservative. That means you have to assume that even a very, even one molecule exposure will cause cancer. And so that's why you know the, the dose response curve has to start from the zero or the start from origin. But in some cases, if it is not carcinogenic, you might actually see a non carcinogenic chemical, you might see a dose response curve like this. What that means is you start seeing the effect at that concentrations, at that high concentrations. Uh, so, those are, you know, for carcinogenic, you have to have it start from the zero. So, again, that's why, you know, con these are the all the definition is in the C153. You don't have to remember any of this. Just know that the threshold uh, to have an impact is zero for carcinogen. That's why for carcinogen, they, they extrapolate everything to zero. So if you are carcinogen, threshold, threshold concentrations equal to zero. Okay, that means you are assuming even little bit exposure will have effect. Uh, so all that other things are there. And so again, this is how they create bioassay and they, did, um, they examine the carcinogen chemicals. And these are the list of chemical I show you, um, the arsenic, chromium-6, chromium-3, and there are some organic pollutants that is known toxicity as carcinogen. And we'll get to that, why they are toxic. Okay. But at least now, so far what you learn is how to, um, how to interpret uh, dose response curve and how do you know which one is more toxic. So uh, now that you have um, learned this one, let's see how many of you um, um, how many of you uh, can answer these questions. So I have a poll, generic polls. You have to choose A, B, C, D. So now between these questions, can anybody says which chemical A or B, which one is more toxic? All right, so 97, um, I'm going to close the poll now. So your answer is 97% says, um, um, this is 97% says chemical A is toxic, 3% um, says chemical B is toxic. Um, well, uh, the answer is A. The reason, as I said, um, if the LD50 is low, that means it's causing toxicity even at very low level. 
Because if you need a lot amount to be toxic, then it's not really that much toxic. You know, we are comparing between two. So that's over here you now. If the LD50 decreases or the smaller amount, then it's become more toxic. That means it's more toxic. Okay. So now between these two, um, can you say which one is more toxic? Chemical A or C? Just based on LD50. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. Um, so 79% says um, chemical A is toxic and 21% says chemical um, C is toxic. Um, so again, um, if, if, it, if you are looking for just LD50 that I would choose that answer. But if I ask you, both K, uh, chemical A and chemical C are carcinogen, and I ask you which one is toxic, more toxic, then I would choose chemical C. The reason is when it comes to a carcinogen, you, are, you don't really care about concentration anymore. You are looking for the exposure. Even at low concentration, it is going to cause cancer. So as you see, at the, below this concentration, so if I'm I said this is the, in this concentration is chemical C has more toxicity um, than uh, chemical uh, A. Uh, so, or at least, you know, you see more, more death at low concentrations, okay? Uh, so then you, it become tricky. So that's why I wanted to see that differences. Any other questions so far on toxicity? Right, so you can ask, you don't have to raise hand, just speak up anytime you have questions. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if there was a way to measure toxicity, not just in terms of like LD50 or mortality, but like quality of life or something like that. Yes, I think, you know, that's a good point. You know, it's not just, you know, death is the only reason why people should worry about. You know, there are stuffs that exposed to that would cause adverse effect. And so, for instance, as I said, PFAS can cause uh, birth defect, something that you know is traumatic uh, as a parent. So I think uh, they do uh, now. They are actually having different types of effects. So when I say over here mortality, that's just the one way to look at the effect. People do look for different effects, but again, those takes time. Uh, the very first test is always mortality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, oh, yes, sorry. go ahead. Um, my question was um, for questions on quizzes or midterms or anything like that, where we're having to look at a percent mortality graph. Um, will those questions mainly be concerned with like which chemical is more toxic at said dosage, or you know, are we going to be looking at specific ranges more yeah, so? Let's say if I ask this question, I'll ask the con the the effect at different concentration range. Okay. Thank you. All right. So again, uh, any questions, stop me anytime. Okay. You don't have to wait for me because this is a, it's important that you, you ask without think without uh, being confused for the comp next slide and slide. So stop me anytime you have um, questions. All right. So we learned that, you know, either way, you know, the first thing you have to do is hazard identification. So you go to the list of EPA that handout and you see the if this chemical is listed in one of them, that means you know this can be hazardous. So that's another way to think is you can look for you know, the chemicals that you find in any products you use and look for those chemicals in, in, the, in the APA list. And uh, that way you know that if it's there, it should not be there, but just, uh, uh, just so that I could practice to see. 
the first thing is to identify and once you identify because some of the chemicals are there as a mixture in those particular substances you do do dose response or exposure assessment dose response assessment is what we just learned exposure assessment is again as you know toxicity is not risk is related to exposure times toxicity right so exposure means whether you are exposed to it or not if you're not exposed to it then it doesn't you don't have to worry about it um so you have to look for whether you are going to get it from water or air or any other ways how you are exposed to it uh, so that's another assessment we'll learn in the rest of the class um but um combining those two it will give you risk once you realize the amount of risk then you talk about management because if it is a uh, you can, if you can prevent exposure then you can do it if you can um replace that chemicals with something else you can do it so these are the different um assessment risk assessment uh, we do um, but again this is not something you'll do as a part of this class uh, um as a you know homework or anything this is something you have to think of if you have a projects related risk or toxicity all right so that's the one set of the class now we are going to discuss a little bit about the reactivity based on chemical structures so as you see you know there are so many types of chemical every day there are mill thousands and thousands of chemicals are introduced and uh, one of the things to think of is maybe there is a pollute there is a type of chemical was um, in your uh, um as i said we use lots of um, i keep saying facial um face uh, cream or all that but it's think of shampoo think of something that daily use uh, think of toothpaste there are chemicals inside it and they supposed not to be toxicity they should not be toxic uh, but you should think of those you know, at least you see what are those so there is always a comparison between couple of products some can have more effect than other for instance you know if you if you use mouthwash there are zero alcohol mouthwash uh, mouthwash and there is alcohol mouthwash means it has so what's the difference is what it does what is the effect these are the questions you should ask so it's important to ask those questions so that you make informed decision based on what you already know so that's next couple of um, slides we'll learn about that so first thing is risk exposure as i said exposure can happens because of air that's one way it can have it can happen because of ground um uh, ground water because the uh, ground water is polluted you are uh, all polluted ground water goes to drinking water then you are exposed to it and if it is air then you are exposed to by inhalations volatile organic contaminant that how you are exposed to it the vocs and then also you can be exposed to soil uh, all they are dropped here and then it goes to the food and then you can eat food okay so food chain so that's another exposure route and maybe it's because of touching you know if you if you touch something you know and that you can uh, expose to that through skin so there are multiple ways so that's why it's important to know the exposure out and based on chemical structure you can actually predict if this is going to be in air or is because it's going to be in the in the water based on that you can actually design your um, treatment system uh, to minimize the exposure because ultimately it's the minimization of exposure so if you know whether it's a volatile or or highly soluble water soluble your treatment will change so how do you predict that so that's what we're going to learn in this class again just to show if it is a, these are the different properties that influence the um whether this is going to be in um, in soil or water and all that for instance henry constant if your henry constant is high that means it's going to be more in gas and if it is more um you know the best on how it is written but if it is more let's say more volatile it will be in the gaseous phase that means you are exposed by inhalations um but if it is let's say henry constant is low it may may not be water soluble but then you look for other structure you know what makes it water soluble if it is water soluble then it will stick with it will stay in ground water that means your exposure is through drinking if it does it's not soluble it will stick with soil that means if you are that means it might be uh, more through the food chain because you know soil has contaminant that will be in the food or if somebody like uh, let's say lead lead is not highly water soluble that means it's most likely be on the soil so if you are kids are playing around as a kid uh, if kids are always used to eat a dirt 
uh, they put everything in their mouth. That means they will be exposed to lead by just uh, playing in that uh, place with polluted lead. So these are all the decisions that comes with the risk. And that's why as a engineer or scientist, you got to know the uh, decision based on that. So we'll go through heavy metals and organic contaminants today. And hopefully by end of this class, just by looking at the, um, the chemical structure, you should be able to predict some of them like that. The first thing is heavy metals. Heavy metals can come from many different products. For instance, you drive car, you have lots of um, equipments in your home. They're all heavy metals. And metals are not necessarily toxic if you toss them, okay? So that's why you know, if you, uh, if silver, think of silver, we wear silver by, you know, somebody has silver, uh, you know, silver, gold, all that stuff, so we wear it. Um, but if you dissolve them in water, they may become toxic, not gold, but silver, uh, because that's how it kills the, the pathogens. Uh, same thing for many heavy metals. When you think of heavy metals, if you put touch of heavy metals, like let's say iron, it's not toxic. But if you dissolve iron and drink it, then it can be iron toxicity. So you got to learn what is toxicity means. You know, here it's all about uh, dissolved metals. So either way, you have metals from all the different products. Pesticide has heavy metals. If you are uh, looking and uh, living near a mining zone, so they have the soil has lots of heavy metals. In residential properties, you use paint, all that stuff. It has also heavy metals. If you're looking for transportations, all the like uh, railways and all that, you know, you know that they are used metals. So either way, these are all different source. And you think of te te television, paints, all these things, daily products that I saw, uh, tap water, if you have the pipes which are made of iron or metals, it might have um, heavy metals. So all those are exposed, release metals uh, into the environment and we are exposed to that. So how do you know which one will have cause and effect? So first thing you have to know is you can identify metals just by looking at periodic table. So these red colors, the area where all the metals are, okay? Um, so if you see, you know, these are alkali metals, you know, these are sodium, magnesium, all the blue, this side are not metals. Other side, these are just the ions, you know, these are, um, these are um, anions. Uh, but everything in between over here are metals. Cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, arsenic, selenium, iron, manganese, chromium, uh, titanium. So these are the most of the things that we look for uh, as a pollutant this, in this particular rows, number four. But there are some more important is like um, silver. So AG is silver, um, that's one thing. And another important is mercury. And uh, let's see, any other lead? So these are the another important. The one thing I wanted to suggest is how do you know which was more toxic? Think of this one, the lead and mercury. So this is lead and this is mercury. What's the difference between lead, uh, mercury and everything else? Mercury is liquid at room temperature. That's one thing. And also if you see, notice these two, these numbers over here, those are their atomic weights, 82, 80, 90, these are atomic numbers. So that means these are heavier, okay? So lead and mercury is very heavy compared to any other metals. Uh, so if it is heavier, it is more likely to stick in our, in our um, yeah, with the fat, okay? So that's another thing to remember. So that's why you know, if you have mercury and lead, it stay in the body. It doesn't go out of the body. And we'll talk about that why if the larger atom, why it is more, more toxic or more reactive. And uh, that's one thing. And second thing you have to think of is everything in between here, uh, why some are more toxic than other, okay? For instance, particularly arsenic, selenium, uh, you probably heard about those arsenic toxicity and why they are toxic. One other thing you have to notice is arsenic is same place as phosphorus, okay? If in the same column, they, behave, they have a similar electronic structure in the out, outer cell. So that means they may, the reaction, the activity is related to electron, uh, how many electrons they have outside. So arsenic and phosphorus has very similar electronic configuration in the outer cell. Uh, so that means they may trick our body in the same way. 
So that's the reason arsenic is toxic because phosphorus is essential element in our body. Arsenic is not, okay? Um, but it has a very similar structure when they are in water. Um, so, so phosphorus is like phosphate, same thing arsenic is like arsenate. It reacts with oxygen and it forms that bond. So when, um, when our cells see a phosphorus, which is a nutrient for us, or phosphate, it thinks that it's arsenic, or it thinks that it's a phosphate if it's arsenic. So that's why you know, it, it, uh, it absorbs the arsenic thinking that it might be phosphorus, and that's how the toxicity is much higher. Um, same thing, other thing, you'll learn about all that. So the, I, what I want to suggest is you should look at those in the periodic table, and you can have some sense just by um, just by comparing the, uh, their location in the periodic table. So this is what you are going to look for. Every time I have elements, you should look for their atomic weight. Okay, so these are atomic, uh, not atomic numbers. So if the atomic number, so these are atomic number. What that means is it is number of protons, okay? Protons in the nucleus, that's what atomic numbers. And they also given indications of what's the atomic weight. Uh, so if it is a high atomic number, it most likely will have atomic weight is high. And as you see, atomic weight here is 70, that's atomic weight. And the reason it's more than 33 is because every nucleus has protons and neutrons. So 33 neutrons and then rest of them are uh, 33 protons and then rest of them are neutrons. Uh, so if it is heavier, that means it's going to have a different reaction, reactivity than uh, other. Uh, so that's one thing you have to look for. And then you have to look for is the outer cell electrons. How many electrons in the outside? Because that causes the reactivity. Okay. So for instance, this is um, in the periodic table. This is, if you remember the previous one, if it is 1A, that means outer cell have one electrons. Okay. Um, so that means it has one excess electrons. Um, if it is two, then it's a two excess electron. If it is three, um, not this one, this is transition. So 3A, that means it has three electrons. And this is outer cell has four electrons. And this is seven electrons. Why it is important? Because uh, this is inert. Okay, this is completely filled. So that says the tendency of them for ability to attract electrons or replace the, or remove that electrons. For this, everything over here, sodium potassium, for them it's easy to remove that one electrons and become uh, inert. So that's why if you think of sodium, they always lose electrons, okay? Na plus when it's in water. So that's why they are called, um, um, cations. But if you look at the other side, chlorine, they always take one electrons and become chlorine minus. And so that's how they, it, uh, it causes different reactivity. So that's why you have to think of those different ways. So now question is, coming back to the point exposure. Exposure depends on whether they are going to be in the air or they are going to be in water or in the soil. So first thing you have to look for, normally we are exposed by, by water. So you want to look for whether they're water soluble or not. And there is no way to predict what's the solubility because metal has different solubility based on what kind of salt they are coming from. For instance, iron, iron sulfate has very different solubility than iron chloride. Um, that's a double two. And it has very different solubility than a POS2 because these are molecules. So they, they bind with each other in a strong different way. Uh, so that means when they're dissolved in water, uh, it, has a, it, it takes different energy to break it. So the, there is no way to predict it, uh, but you have to look for online um, the solubility of that particular, uh, particular chemicals. Uh, so again, that's the first thing to look for. And second, as I said, its binding ability to organic matter will determine how toxic they are in our body. As I said before, mercury and lead more likely to bind with the fat, okay? And the reason is they have, the way they are uh, reacted, they, they are attracted towards certain type of um, 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 functional group that is only available in the fat. 
I will get to that. The third thing you have to look for is the oxidation state. Oxidation state will you all learn in your chemistry class and to some extent in C153. I'll just quickly go through that. Uh, but what it means that if you have pure metal, if oxidation state means it doesn't release any electrons, it's all completely filled, oxidation state is zero. But if it's pure metals dissolved to become a P2 plus, release two electrons, this oxidation state is two plus. Okay. So that basically tells the valency or the valence of that particular atoms. So same thing, aluminum, it goes to aluminum three plus three electrons. Some metals have multiple oxidation set. For instance, iron can also have a P3 plus plus three electrons. And you got to remember this thing. There is no way to, you know, there are the only few can, few metals that you are dealing with, so it's better to remember. But one way to I will suggest is just a easy way to remember is everything that is within this two group, this green color, okay, they have one oxidation state. That means potassium, because one electrons, it has only it can be only K plus, it cannot be K2 plus, all that. Okay. So everything over here, sodium. Na plus, potassium, K plus. Anything over here, it will be two plus. But anything in this transitional metal, like the metal over here, it can may or may not have a multiple valency. For instance, copper, it can be copper plus and copper two plus. Iron, two plus, three plus. Uh, if some other, like for instance, zinc, it cannot have multiple, it has just one. Uh, so you just have to remember those because we are only dealing with few of them, not every all of them. So those known known um, known metal, you should remember them. And why it is important? Again, as I said, mercury and leads are very uh, heavy metals, or the the bigger metals, so they stick to the fat. And if you have different oxidation state, their solubility also change. That means your exposure to water is going to change. And again, you just have to remember it. Arsenic three is more water soluble than arsenic five. You know. Again, we are not calculating based on uh, free energy, all that. So at this point, I cannot tell you why, uh, but if you know what's the, how to calculate free energy, this, that's how we know that this is high solubility. For this class, just know the, just remember them, which is more soluble so that if you're dealing with a particular site, which has arsenic as a pollutant, you will be able to uh, make informed decision about remediations. And Again, just a question is um, why we are dealing with all these metals and all these other factors. Um, why even we think of their difference, think of this way, calcium, lead, both have two plus charge. The only difference they have is uh, lead is extremely heavy. That means it has atomic weight is much higher. Calcium is smaller. And because of that similarity, calcium is very similar to lead in the sense that it has two plus charge, it does have certain effect, okay? So if you see of our neurons, our brains, calcium has, calcium signaling is important for our neuron activities. So every time there is a neuron, so the, the brain activity takes place, calcium is exchanged in that particular area. So you see over here, calcium is exchanged in between that cell. So this is very important, that calcium exchange is very important for neuron activities. But imagine if you have a lead and your early, early, um, early time when our brain is being developed for a child, that's the time this activity is much higher. So that means during that time, if a child is exposed to lead, lead can get in, but it cannot get out. It doesn't have that exchange inside. So once it's inside, as I said, it stick to the fat, stick to the brain cell, it cannot come out anymore. So that means that child has led forever. And uh, so that can um, hinder the developments of brain activities. So that's why it's very important when you think of lead uh, exposure, it's very important to protect the child. As, a, uh, as we are like you now adults, that time the lead concentration will have less impact because our brain is developed. So we don't really, um, and our body weight is higher. So the typical concentration that we are exposed is is not very high compared to our body weight. So again, as you see, this is another example, just to see if you, if you know the 
um, their atomic weight, you might be able to predict which one is more toxicity. Any question? Another thing that you have to think of is for environmental engineer or environmental scientist, we are mostly dealing with exposure through water. So when you think of metal, that's why I said, you touching, touching iron is not going to cause any toxicity, but iron, high concentration iron in water can cause iron toxicity. And uh, so that means we are dealing with the reactivity of that particular metals ion in water. So the metal ion itself has a different reactivity if it is in water or somewhere else. The reason is, as I said, water is very reactive and corrosive. So every time there is an ion inside water, I, I, um, water itself is going to react with them. And this is how we react. For instance, think of this here, sodium. And water has oxygen and hydrogen. So all the water molecules are because of the difference in their uh, oxygen and hydrogen electronegativity means how how likely they attract that shared electrons. Uh, oxygen typically pull the electrons towards it. So that's why you see this bond is a little bit angled. I think it's nearly 107 degree. So because of that change, you know, it caused a dipole moment because of that charge is imbalanced now. Most of the negatives are towards posit oxygen, positive are towards hydrogen. So that's why this is a polar solvent. Polar solvent means it has some ions. And because of that, anything ion inside water is going to react with that, um, that uh, water molecules. So if you think of sodium here, um, all the water molecules, the, the oxygen is negatively charged. So they will uh, arrange the oxygen around it. So that means water is going to engulf that. Oxygen will all align near the sodium. Same thing opposite way. If you have chloride ions, which is negatively charged, all the hydrogen has a little bit positive charge. So that means all the water molecules will uh, opposite way uh, arrange across the chlorine. So that means the reactivity of any particular metals depends on how many water molecules surrounding to it. So that's why anytime you think of toxicity in water, think of do they attract lots of water? If they do attract lots of water, it will not cause much toxicity. And that's what exactly happened for sodium and calcium. Sodium and calcium are very small um, atom. That means nucleus is very close to the outer cell. That's why they attract lots of water molecules. If the atom be it become bigger and bigger, nucleus is too far away from the outer cell, so they don't attract that much, um, that much water. So that's why when you have one lead inside your water, it doesn't get bound by water that much. So that means it can react or stick with anything without worrying about that water that surrounds it. But calcium, it will so engulf by water that it doesn't react with other things because that water has to be displaced before it can react with anything else. So that's why we have to think of hydration sphere anytime you think of toxicity of metals. Hydration sphere means if you have a metals, let's say positively charged metal, the moment you drop that positive charge because it dissolved that electron is gone, now it's positively charged, for instance, iron two. Now all the water molecules, so water is going to, will engulf that one. So that means these waters are tightly bind with that metal atoms or metal ions. So anywhere that metal ions move, it moves along with that water. So that means this is called hydration sphere, okay? And why it is important? Because we are talking about toxicity here. I'm drinking that water. Now this, if this water is not letting it go, it will not react with any fat. Let's say this is fat. It has functional group, okay? Functional group. For metals to attach to this one, this water molecule has to be removed. But if they are really strongly bind with water, they are not going to let it go. So that means it's not going to be reactive. That's why it's important to know which metals are not going to have high reactivity. And this is the reason. So the for um, two formula that you can remember. Number one, if a, if an atom is small atoms, that means that nucleus is very, it doesn't have much electron cell around it. 
it is going to attract water very strongly. So that's why anything is a small atomic number, it has more water molecule around it. If it is high atomic number, it has less atomic molecule because its cell is much bigger. So it doesn't have that much attractions. And second thing is charge. If you have, let's say iron two versus iron three. Okay. Both have similar number of electron cell around it. The only difference is it has three plus charge. Another is two plus charge. And if I ask you which one will uh, attract more water, it's based on charge, as you know, water has this little bit charge, that's how they're attracted. So whoever has more charge, will attract more water. That means the reactivity will also decrease because you have to displace that water before it can react. So if I just ask you a question, where the hydrogen sphere is higher, first look for charge. If the charge is high, hydrogen sphere is high. Then if the charge is same, then look for the atomic numbers. Now, if the atomic number is smaller, that means if the atom is smaller or the nucleus is smaller or very close to the outer cell, it will have more water. So that is written here. Um, the hydrogen sphere, the size of hydrogen sphere increases with increase in charge of ions and decreases with uh, increase in size of atom. So that means if you become bigger and bigger, that the size of atom increases, charge doesn't increase, that means your hydrogen sphere will decrease. That means your cesium is more reactive than sodium. That's why, you know, if you think of cesium toxicity, it is because cesium is higher atom, it doesn't have much water molecules around it. And, but if you go compare between sodium and magnesium, sodium has Na+, plus, magnesium Fg2+, plus. magnesium has more water around it because two plus charge, it will attract more. So that's the, all about um, hydration sphere. Again, we are discussing hydration sphere because it does affect the toxicity. So now let's have a quiz just to see how many of you uh, learned this one. All right, which cation has a larger hydration radius? Sodium, magnesium, aluminum. I'm just going to highlight where is sodium. This is sodium, this is magnesium. This is aluminum, okay. So if you are in the same row, that means outer cell is not changing. The only thing change is charge. And here I give you charge, which, which one will have more um, larger hydration radius, needs more water molecules surrounding it. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. Few only few few of you responded. Just think of what happens if the charge increases. The charge increases, it attracts more water molecules. That's what we write before. All you have to look for is the charge here. All right, so I'm going to um, show the poll. 84% says this one and 16% um, says Sodium. Again, the right answer is aluminum. And the reason it has more charge, that means it attracts more water molecules. Okay. A more charge means more water molecules. Now ask you another question. Which cation has a larger hydration radius? Here in this time, I didn't change the charge, but I changed the size. Okay, so this is magnesium, calcium, strontium. So again, if you have bigger atom, same charge, the nucleus is far away. So that means you cannot pull that much um, um, water. Think of that as a concept. Okay, I'm going to end the poll in a few seconds. It's one minute done, so I'm gonna end it. 71% um, says this and 
3% here, 26% says this, okay? Um, again, think of this way. So the reason we discuss here is that uh, now the charge are same, that means the, the nucleus have same pull, but now which nucleus is closer to that uh, outer cell because that's where the wire is going to stick, okay? And so now the question is, which one is the smaller charge, smaller atom? Whichever is the smaller atom, the nucleus is close to the uh, close to the um, outer cell. So between magnesium, calcium, strontium, their magnesium is the smallest atom. So that means it should have the highest. The right answer is magnesium. Okay. So um, so that that's all for the metals. And uh, I just the last thing I want to say is. The reason I said uh, mercury and lates are more attached to fat is because how they attract to different types of uh, functional group. And functional group, so um, if you see heavy metals here somewhere, let's see, this is heavy metals. So mercury is soft metals. Soft metals is just the definitions, okay, soft and hard. Um, the, the, that's based on the Lewis acid classifications. So soft metals or soft uh, acid will react with the soft base, okay? So that means if there is mercury, it was going to more attracted towards soft base like sulfate, okay? Anything with a sulfide is going to attract to mercury a lot more. Anything with a um, hard base, for instance, over here, let's say, think of chromium. Chromium is the hard base. It will attract towards most likely these uh, carbonate and other species. Uh, so that's why you know if you most of the fat uh, happen to be soft uh, base, so that's why mercury and lead bind with that one. Just uh, definitions. So again, this is the why we already discussed. So that's all about this one. And again, just to idea that you know why toxicity, uh, the solubility is different is based on the different oxidations group. I Means whether it's three plus or two plus, it makes a big differences. And uh, which one is more tox? How do you know what's the oxidation state? In uh, C153, we learned this one. I'm just going to write very quickly how to determine oxidation state because I write arsenic 3. Usually, arsenic is present as arsenite. There is no arsenic 3 plus in, or, uh, in, uh, in water. So, this is usually present like that. So, if I ask you what is the oxidation state, C153 will know. All you have to do is Calculate arsenic and oxygen is minus two. You have to assume oxygen is minus two, hydrogen is plus one. These are some you can assume, okay? Times there are three oxygen and total charge is minus three. So arsenic, if you do minus three, this is three plus. If you take it the other side, this becomes plus three. That's why it is written three plus. So this is the way you can calculate oxidation state. So if you don't know how to calculate oxidation state, I suggest you uh, looked at um, just online, okay? Online, how to calculate oxidation. I just show you right here. You know? I gave you some extra slide. I'm not going to go through, go through that one because it's pretty basic information. Um, but if you don't know how to calculate, you should, uh, this is from C153 slides. Uh, just go through that and learn that one on your own. And there'll be one question on oxidation state on your, um, on your uh, quiz. So I'll give you a molecular formula like this and I'll ask you what's the oxidation state of a uh, element. For instance here, if I calculate this one, N equal, what is the oxidation state of N? Again, hydrogen is plus one times four. Total charge is plus one, so this is plus one. So that means n equal to plus one. This is plus four. And if you go take it the other side, minus four, that's minus three. All right, so that's all. I gave you this example and uh, you can do it later. Calculate the oxidation state of iron in all those three. So let's take a break for uh, 10 minutes before um, then we can come back uh, to work on organic chemicals, solubility and all that. In that 10 minutes, if you want, you can do these examples and uh, and uh, if you have question, we'll, we'll talk about it. Any questions so far for, uh, for the um, whatever we cover so far? 
Okay. All right. So we we take a break for 10 minutes. I'm going to stop recording now and we'll be back in um in 10 minutes. So it's 5 14. So we'll be back at 5 24. Okay, so while you are away, um, I ask you to calculate the oxidation state of ions in all these different um, compounds or molecule. And I, <coughs> I think I gave you a wrong formula. I don't know. Hydroxide has a hydroxide has two here. Otherwise, this is not uh, thermodynamically possible. So. We corrected that and then I calculated it. I hope you can match your answers. <clears throat> anyway, so just one um, one questions uh, will be on oxidation state on your quiz next week. So you should know how to calculate it. All right, so now we learn everything about um, um, heavy metals. What we don't know is the organic contaminants, organic chemicals, which by far the most um, uh, important pollutants when it comes to um, remediations or hazardous chemicals because a lot of um, organics, there are only few heavy metals. The periodic table, it has like five, 10 or 20. We don't have much, you know. But when it comes to organic chemicals, they are like infinite, you know. There are, so every, every uh, different change in organic structure, you have a different chemical. So you have a thousands and thousands and chemicals are introduced every day. So that's why it's very important to know organic contaminants to some extent. So these are the list of organ, we discuss about this. So the list of chemicals or metals that you are interested or things to look for is roughly these are. Uh, there are some written, not written here, but these are the typical heavy metals. Um, but if you are thinking of organic contaminants, there are many, this is just a few list of them. Um, uh, so now when you see this, chemical structure or name, it doesn't mean much, uh, but a lot of times the moment you see, let's say this is chlorobenzene, dichlorobenzene, it means there are two chlorine in a benzene atom, or benzene molecules. Uh, so what it does, it, it tells you the functional group and those functional group will tell you what's the behavior of that particular one in, a, in nature. For instance, benzene, benzene is, this is benzene. If you know, this is a benzene ring. If you think of chlorobenzene, all it means is it has a chlorine here. It says one, four dichlorobenzene. It means there are one, two, three, four, five, six different positions and four position has chlorine. Same thing, nitrobenzene means, you know, you have benzene molecule and it has one mm, nitro group. So this is how you can define different structure. And by having those different group, Another way to let's say this one. This is another functional group. So having this different change in structure, it completely changes toxicity and behavior. For instance, if you add chloride, it makes it very stable. That means it's going to leave, it's going to be very persistent in in a, in the environment for a long time. And um, it's not easy to degrade. Uh, but if you do hydroxide, uh, it is easy to degrade. And it's not that tough, that much stable. That means microbially, it can be easy to degrade. And adding OH, it can also increase the uh, increase the solubility. So that's all these things you are looking for. Anytime you look for organic pollutants, you look for what's the structure, what kind of functional group it has. It can tell you a little bit more about solubility as well as the volatility natures. <clears throat> so first thing you have to know is a little bit background that organic contaminants can come from many different sources. Almost everything we use has some kind of solvent or some kind of organic um, chemicals. If you look at your uh, toothpaste, it has organic chemicals. If you, uh, if you looked at your, uh, uh, almost anything, there is a number, there is a name for it. Uh, so it doesn't mean that it's toxic. You know? You've got to look for what they are structurally mean. Um, so um, they come from different applications. Uh, as I said, the, by far the biggest application for organic chemicals are solvent. We use solvent for many things. And then second most is pesticide, all that other aspect, um, paint, all that factors. 
The third one is a very recent is fluorinated organic, which is PFAS. It's coming from this uh, um, fire extinguishing foam. It has lots of these fluorinated organics. And when I say uh, organic chemicals, the part of this class, you have to start developing a thinking process when you can say whether this is more soluble, I means if it's going to be a groundwater pollutants or it's more volatile or how persistent is going to be. Uh, you may not know a lot about it, but just by looking for very specific functional group, we don't have lots of functional group, only few of them, which I listed here. So just by looking at them, you can tell whether this is soluble or not. For instance, here I wrote it. Uh, you have carboxylic acid, you have, oh, this is all carbon, okay? So this means carbon. When I write this one, this means all carbon hydrogen, okay? So this means, you know, you have a mean group, you have acid group, you have ester group, we have OH group, you know. So all this means that it increased the solubility to some extent. This is OH group. Okay, so OH uh, makes the hydrogen bonding. Uh, so that's why you know, any time you see this functional group, it, it makes them more water soluble. Some functional group makes more soluble than other. So that's why you know, any time you see part of this class, you got to think of two things. What makes it more soluble? What makes it more volatile? That's how we can design the remediations. So you learn that in next uh, couple of slides. So again, uh, if you took C153, we just discussed briefly, and this is the same thing we'll do. Um, first thing is whether it's going to be volatile or not. Again, Henry constant is one way to know. Um, <clears throat> so Henry constant is something, if it's a high Henry constant, and the Henry constant is concentration of pollutants in air divided by concentration of pollutant in water. Um, it could be also reverse. This is just one way to write it. Let's say we assume this is air by water. So that means if the Henry constant is higher, that means it's more likely to stay in air. So that's why it can be highly volatile. Um, so, but you don't know Henry constant. When you see a chemical formula, you have to look for Henry constant somewhere else. But before even that, if you know just the structure, you can tell whether this Henry constant will be higher or lower, just based on functional group and the number of carbon. So the, the best way to remember is think of methane. Methane is a gas. The reason methane is a gas is because it has one carbon, okay? Same thing, ethane. Ethane is C2. Um, um, so this is one, this is ethane, okay? Each carbon can have uh, four different bonds. Um, so this is also volatile, uh, but if you keep adding more and more carbon, it becomes less and less volatile. The reason is it's very easy to uh, evaporate a smaller molecules. Um, but that's one way to know. If you have more carbon, it's heavier, so it stays in water. Uh, but uh, hold on. Yeah, I'm thinking you can come here. No, go back. I'll be back in five minutes. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, what I was saying is, if you have you know, less number of carbon, a small molecule, it's easy to escape to air. So that's one way to look for, and that's all applied less than five or six carbon atom. If it is more than six or seven, it's not volatile, so it's not applicable anymore. They are all going to be not volatile. And the second thing is also the, the functional group that can make it stick with water. So any of this functional group that you can see over here, that will make it stick with water or stay in the soil. Uh, so if you have more functional group, that will, we can call it as a, um, as a uh, um, less, uh, less volatile. So, um, so that's why, you know, as I said, you know, if you, if I give you, ask a questions, you'll be able to find uh, if it is a uh, water soluble or not just by looking at the functional group. I gave you an ex example here. Um, there are two, two organic molecules, ethanol, and meet this particular one. And I said, OH group 
will form hydrogen bonding. COOH group, which is acidic, they also form hydrogen bonding. Anytime you see two less, two different in electronegativity um, atom bonding together, O and H, uh, that's the electronegative. Same thing, N and H, they are highly different in uh, electronegativity. So, which makes it uh, more likely to interact by hydrogen bonding. Uh, so anytime you see this functional group, you, you know that these are uh, highly soluble. So based on that over here, you see this OH group is going to form hydrogen bonding. Whereas this OC, organic and carbon, they're not that different in hydrogen bonding. So that's why it's not going to form it. So if I ask any question, just first look for the number of carbon. If there is no functional group involved, then look for number of carbon. It's less carbon, it's more volatile, it's smaller molecule. If the similar number of carbon, look for functional group. If it, is, it has any of these functional group, then it becomes less volatile. So that's just the one way to predict. Now, second thing is, um, so I just explain everything over here. If you have longer chain, it's a less uh, 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 water soluble, okay? So for instance, our three over here, you have three different uh, contaminants and um, the only difference between them, they have same functional group. That means they can all form hydrogen bonding. And the only difference is this has less carbon. So if I ask which one is more volatile than the one with the less carbon. Any question on that? Same thing for water solubility. If you have more carbon, it doesn't really makes it water soluble. Um, the reason is uh, water is hydrophilic. You know that's the whole reason of hydrophilic. If you have more number of carbon, the water cannot arrange around it, uh, so they still stay away from water. You bind with fat, bind with other other aspect. So if you have more number of carbon, so solubility decreases. So these are the only few things you have to remember: functional group, number of carbon that can predict your solubility as well as the other things. So now let's see how much of you guys learn from it. Um, again, just to summarize, I'll write it here. If you have more carbon, less soluble. If you have more functional group, hydrogen bonding functional group, it is, sol it is more soluble. Okay. All right, so let's have a quiz now. Again, this is also, you might have learned in um, C153, but this is just a refresher so that you can apply. Sriyan. Sorry about that. Which one is more? Right, we have a few more seconds before I close the um, poll. So I gave you structure here. Um, which one of the chemical would have greater solubility in water? So again, solubility depends on functional group and number of carbons. You can see the other, how big the molecule is. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. I shared the result. Um, so again, 18, 60% chose this one, 37% chose this, and 3% chose this. All right, any, any volunteers, why you chose which one? Again, I don't expect you to know the right answers because this is right away. We didn't have time to observe it, so it should explain everything that you think so that our whole class can learn where you can get confused during during the um, 
during the um, quiz? I uh, picked B, phenol, because of the functional group OH. I okay. guess that would help bond with water and increase solubility. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the correct way uh, because based on functional group. And I can also see that where people can get confused is um, between benzene and phenanthrene, benzene has less number of carbon. So maybe, you know, that's why some of you uh, chose that one. It has less carbon. It doesn't look like, you know, it's the smallest atom. Um, so it's true uh, to some extent, but if you have functional group, that kind of... Uh, uh, makes it hydrogen bonding. You know? So that, that's why it's number of carbon. The phenol and benzene both have same number of carbon. Uh, so if you have same number of carbon, then you look for functional group. So that's why benzene cannot be, okay? But if I give you a choice between benzene and phenanthrene, then you choose benzene. That's the correct way of thinking. So between these two, there is no difference in carbon, benzene and phenol. There is no difference in carbon. Um, for this example, could we also use the Henry's law constant if we know it's smaller and there's like a greater concentration of water? No, this is a, well, I, I think this is written there just more on volatility nature. Yeah. Uh, so it's not about the solubility. Yeah. That's just because the periodic table was there. That's why I wrote it there. You don't have to look at that. All right, so how about, um, Again, uh, another try for another question. Which of the chemical could, uh, would have lowest solubility in water? Oh, I gave the same one. So it's not, this is not a the same question. No, you know what? I, I asked different question here, lowest solubility. Other one I saw the highest solubility. This one I asked the lowest solubility. Lowest solubility is the um, one which has the highest number of carbon or uh, no functional group. Okay, that's how we think of this way. Okay, so I'm gonna close the thing in five seconds. Okay, so I end the poll. So here are the results. Um, so 93%, I'm gonna write this is the right answer, okay. So now 93% chose C and 2% or 7% chose A. <clears throat> okay, so again, the question one, which one has the lowest solubility? Again, the solubility increases with a decrease in number of carbon, okay. So that means if you see who, which has the lowest, I said lowest solubility, which has the most number of carbon. So as you see over here, this has six carbon because one, two, three, four, five, six. This is six carbon, carbon number. This is six, this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So this is 14 carbon. So that means the, the lowest one would be phenanthrene. So if I have to arrange everything, so the solubility wise, the highest solubility will be phenol because it has the functional group. That will be more than benzene. Will be more than phenanthrene. Okay. All right, so last questions before we end this class. Which molecule would be um, more likely to diffuse into the air, means which has more volatile? Why, I probably answered this question already. So the one which cannot form hydrogen bonding would diffuse more because both have similar number of carbon atoms and every atoms are similar. Atomic weight is exactly same. 
टू कार्बन सिक्स हाइड्रोजन वन ऑक्सीजन So ask which one will be more likely to diffuse into air means which one no, less likely to stay in water. The one which is more likely to stay in water is the one which form hydrogen bonding. Okay, there are still um, four students have not responded yet. I'll give you three more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Again, uh, you should respond whether you will know the answer or not, because you learn more. I don't really check who is writing what. I don't even, you know, you don't supposed to know every all of these. So trying is important. All right, 22 of you voted. Um, so share the results, 75%, um, 25% chose yet. Uh, it's very important that you also say why you chose those uh, because that will help me identify what uh, possible way we could um, think different way. So it's, uh, don't discount your answer, even if it's a wrong answer. Um, so answer B is the correct answer um, because it doesn't form hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is formed by uh, wedge group um, because oxygen hydrogen has very different electronegativity, they'll attract towards the water different way. Oxygen will bind with hydrogen of water and uh, hydrogen will bind with uh, oxygen. That's how it works. So the answer is this, but any, any volunteer, if you want to explain a possible way to get confused um, for number A, because uh, B is the right answers, because it doesn't form hydrogen bond. But again, as I said, you know, there is one way, uh, there is one right answers, but wrong answer is also important to think about and discuss. Uh, so I don't definitely judge any of you for wrong answer. In fact, you learned a lot from wrong answer than right answer. Uh, so it's very important for students, all of you, to share your answers um, or a different way of thinking, because that's important for us to understand. Um, so that's all for the, I think, um, um, in terms of what we need to cover. I just want to um, want to suggest at the end that um, the group we have to form by Tuesday. Uh, so if you know somebody, if you want to be in the same group, uh, you should discuss with each other and uh, when you are one of you suggest a name and say that I have another two person and suggest their name. So when I put the group, I put all of you in the same group. Okay, so you can start doing that on campus where uh, don't send me email on that because I'll lose track of email. But if I see on campus where it's easy for me to uh, aggregate them. And so choosing a topic is not important or required to form a group. Uh, first you form a group you know, and I, um, I'll also suggest, because you can choose topic later. Um, so again, the, the topic can be uh, anything. As I said, I just give example of topic. Um, I'll also post title of uh, last year project so that you have a sense of what other students did last year. Um, so here is the different topics that you can think of. You could think of a remediation method. If you go to your syllabus, you know there are many remediation methods we, we, we will cover. Uh, we can pick one of them if you are interested in learning about any of one of them. For instance, bioremediation is one of the popular um, uh, techniques. And you can think of how to use bioremediation to remove a specific pollutants. Uh, and same thing, some other type of techniques. And then the second one is a, is a site specific. For instance, if you know a particular site in LA or anywhere in the world that you are concerned about and you wanted to uh, think of how to design a treatment or remediation design for that site, we can also do that. Uh, but for that precondition is you should know there, is a, there has to be a report somewhere else that can explain what the site about. Because you cannot just imagine what pollutants are there. Um, and the third one is technology specific. If there is a new techniques that you wanted to learn more about it, 
And then you can say that I want to use that as a project. For instance, anaerobic digester, something is used to create compost or create a energy or methane gas. That's just one other uh, one example. And then could be also problem specific. For instance, if you want to learn about how to recycle plastic or how to uh, use plastic for different way, that's another project. Or some, for instance, e-waste. Uh, nowadays, there are so much e-waste, electronic waste that you don't know how to handle it. So you, if you want to learn more about that, you can use that as a specific project. So you, you just have to define the problem. You say, okay, this is the problem I want to work on. And then another is sustainable specific because uh, think of, you know, everybody is going to use solar panel on top of their, uh, uh, um, their uh, um, let's say solar panels all the times we are going to use for energy. Uh, what's the negative consequence? Are we dealing with the waste that comes from this particular type of practice? Is this the, is, what kind of waste management will be better to manage all these used solar panels? What kind of toxic from that will come? So again, these are all open-ended questions. There is no right, wrong answer. I just want you to choose the questions that you are interested in. And this, uh, uh, this uh, class will allow you to learn that and will train you for that. Uh, so uh, think of all that and start forming a group. I'll, I'll start putting this, uh, you know, if you already thought of a topic, then you can suggest that on campus web. And if you have any friends or colleagues or, or classmates that you know that they are interested in that, suggest their name. That way other students can join in there. And if once it become more than eight, I'll, uh, that group is closed. That means nobody else can join because maximum you are allowed to have eight students um, and minimum five or six, whatever I wrote there, okay? All right, so that's all for the class today. I'll see you next week. Uh, again, the, don't forget to work on homework. Uh, whatever we cover, there are some questions you can answer already. Maybe all of those questions. So you should start working on that. Any question? All right, so I am going to stop share. Um, and uh, I think that's all. I'll see you next week on Tuesday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.